Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day. Yesterday was Thanksgiving. Hope you enjoyed it with your friends, your family, and, and everybody else that that got around with you. And now maybe you're munching on some, um, some leftovers if there was any, ooh, excuse me, if there was any leftover. Maybe I took a flight home or two. had a good Thanksgiving yesterday. I spent it with um, with my girlfriend and soon to be fiance. We're pr practically in that stage. I just haven't proposed yet because um, I'm planning it. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, um, the reason why I'm making this video is I, I shared this actually with her this morning. Um, shucks. Where's my Bible at? I don't know what the at. No. <laughs> it's right here. It was something I shared with her this morning. And great. It's uh, still exactly where I need it to be. Um, and I was just processing. Like, I generally am processing. If any of you follow me here on my page, you know I'm always talking about something, processing something. And, and just, we were talking about just what we're seeing and and the sadness of it and Quite honestly, um, as a black man, I, I don't. Es it doesn't escape me what I continue to see um, in this country, as well as spreading globally. Pretty much, I mean, globally in the sense of all of the major countries that are reporting. You know, the social justice warrior. The, the reforms and, and whatnot. And, <clears throat> and I started talking with her. And I said, on my 40th birthday, I was reading scripture one morning. And it was technically out of my plan, reading plan, right? And I'm going to read to you what I, what I read that morning that just kind of blew my mind away. And had me just sitting here asking, okay, God, what are you saying to me? Um, what are you getting my attention about? Not from the perspective of how is this written for me, but but because this has been written in the context that it's been written, what are you getting my attention about in this time? And on December 13th, uh, 2000, what, 20, uh, I turned 40, right? Um, and... Not two, that, what was it? Yeah, was it? Anyway. <laughs> the year I turned 40. This is what I read. Sitting in Bremerton, uh, Washington, in my brother's kitchen. Just to, starting, you know, with my coffee and... And I sat and I read this. When he was 40 years old. What? <laughs> When he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing, so this is Acts 7, starting at verse 23. And I'll just say it again, and, and, I'll, and I'll finish up this, this paragraph, right? When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the, the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day he appeared to them and uh, as they were quarreling and trying to reconcile them, saying, Men, 
You are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But saying, you know, you are brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. And I shared that with Rue, who is my, my girlfriend, this morning, and I began to cry. As I began to watch and think about what I'm watching now, and even at that moment sharing with her, how it struck me then, and how it strikes me now. It makes me sad. And it angers me that I'll say I'll, uh, I'll say it a couple of different ways that my people, right, black people, have been sold this ideology that that turns us against one another. It angers me that all people that have been sold this ideology that turns us against each other are killing and hurting each other. And, and I thought about it even more. I used to have this ideology of that is predominantly found on the left right now, this democratic ideology the oppressed ideology. How sad is that? That you always have to be the victim. That you're told that you're always the victim. I've said it in other videos. If you tell somebody enough that they're the victim, They'll believe that they're the victim, even when you tell them you don't have to be, but I am, there's nothing else for me. But what happens when the ideology turns around, though painful it may be, though scary it may be, what happens? You begin to rise up. You begin to think differently. And you begin to believe another way is possible. I have a disability, right? A little detour into this. <laughs> and I used to be on public assistance, right? For dis my disability. And at a point, they told me that I would lose my benefits because I began to um, surpass limits of, of uh, you know, you only you can only make so much right on Social Security, right? Disability. And I began to surpass that. And it was scary because what ends up happening when, when people are on Social Security disability, or any Social Security for that matter, really, is that if you make too much, even one half of a cent over, you're, you're told, you're cut off. You're told you can't make this. You're not allowed to make any more, much more, unless you're on a program, because there are programs within Social Security Disability that, you know, it's called like Ticket to Work, and it may be called different things where you are. But even then, it, 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 it really is sometimes tough. But I have, was faced with this, this choice of, do I, do I lose these benefits 
that are paying me to, in some ways, not reach my potential? Or do I lose these benefits and believe that I have potential to be reached and do what I can and, and, and should to reach that potential? I decided to go for my potential, even with my disability. And here's what I found. That I'm much more than what I thought. That's good. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily easy. It was scary. Because the way the system is set up, it in some ways, it'll cut you off at the knees and you're like, but I'm trying to walk or run or and you can't barely crawl with two nubs, right? And here I, I see predominantly, it started really with the black community, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. I don't care. The organization doesn't care about black lives. They care about oppressor, oppression care about race baiting they they care about their pockets too they care that that you remain oppressed in mind and then you have a lot of white folks with black lives matter the organization you're oppressed you're oppressed you're oppressed and if you agree, you're my brother, man. I'm, but, but if you enter into a conversation with a lot of these white folks uh, that, that are espousing this lie, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't agree with me and I can't really speak on your behalf because I'm not black or I'm not a woman, or I'm not a man, or I'm not dot, 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 dot. Then why are you trying to tell me that I'm oppressed in the first place? If you don't understand who I am, where I am, and where I've come from, why would you dare try to tell me that I'm to stay where you suppose that I've always been oppressed? Do you see the, the hypocrisy in that? I can't walk in your shoes. I don't walk in your shoes. Yet I'm telling you to stay in your shoes because that's all you could ever be. That is another form of oppression. That is another form of racism or even sexism. Do you see the hypocrisy in that? And I look and I watch. And at the end of the day, this is what this is designed to do. To steal away one's potential. Tell me what I cannot be and I won't become it. Tell me what I am as a, as a enslaved, non-thinking human being with potential, and I will rely on you to tell me what I never can be and never reach my full potential. But challenge me and tell me that I am more than I think that I am and all that I could ever be as I am designed to become as a woman, as a man, as a young black man, young black woman, old, young, alike, white, brown, whatever, and I will become that. I will reach my potential because not just because I'm told that I can, but because I'm also challenged to, to, to discover my potential. I didn't think that I was smart. I didn't think that I was intelligent. Let me tell you, as I grew up as a kid, my father, dead, at the age of 11, I found him. 
1992, 7.30 a.m. It was a Thursday in January. I remember it like it was yesterday. Before he died, I remember a lot of a lot of boys, a lot of girls that say this to their dads. And side note again, fathers, stay in the home. If you have the ability to lay down and go ahead and plant your seed into the woman you're laying with, and she gets pregnant, and you jet out, ladies, he was a loser in the first place. He wasn't ready. I know, because I used to be that. At any rate, before he passed away, when I was seven or eight, I remember telling him, I want to be just like you, Dad. He told me, don't you ever say that again. After that, I had no clue who I was supposed to be like. I had no clue, no clue why he would say that to me. Smash my world with a word. years and even decades I don't know who I'm supposed to be men and women would tell me I see so much potential in you I, oh man I see it in you and I'm asking what, what, what do you see what do you see I don't know I, I can't tell you I don't know and that was the most infuriating thing for me to hear because I longed to know what I was made for. As a young man, as a young black man, because I had desires and I had misappropriated desires. I didn't know how to reach potential. I really didn't understand what potential was. <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't, their fault, but I was aggravated by what they saw because I didn't understand. The man that I wanted to be like that could have maybe told me a little more was gone. So I was susceptible to sucking up every form of manhood that I thought I should suck up. When it came to sex, when it came to sexuality, when it came to dating, when it came to, um, you know, whatever else there is, you know, let's say, for instance, jobs. I mean, I, I had friends that I would follow that were just hoes. I'm just putting it out there like that. They were just hoes. They knew how to get women. We would go to the club, and their main objective was to take some something, something home, right? And they would, they would take something home. And I thought I was supposed to take something home too. I didn't take too many somethings home, thankfully. And I didn't get their something that they got when they took something home. I thought that was success. I wanted to be a salesman because I figured if I could make a lot of money, I'd be successful. I figured if I could be like any of the dudes that I hung with, and not all of them were hoes. <laughs> and I hope the ones that were hoes aren't hoes anymore. But I, I wanted so badly to become who or what they were because... That must mean what potential is. But even in college, I would hear people say, well, you, I see you. I see what's in you. And I'm like, what do you see? What do you see? Don't tell me that. If you can't, definitely tell me what you see. And it's not their fault that they couldn't. They saw potential, but they didn't know me. 
to reach into the depths of who I was or am, to say, this is what I see exactly. You're a speaker. You're a counselor. You know how to figure things out from the inside out. You're good at, at thinking methodically. You're good with people. You lead with passion first, then articulate your methodic idea second, and sometimes the other way around. No one knew me well enough to be able to tell that to me. You have potential. So I watch you. Coming back around. I'm watching these black men and black women, young and old, <laughs> run around. And it's not just hands hanging, sagging. I used to do that too. Running around, not knowing their potential and receiving the lie that they're just oppressed, that somebody's holding them down. I get it. I was there too. Somebody's always doing something to me. Everything is racist. Everything is somebody else's fault. I went and stole, you know, things from Nordstrom's or Walgreens or CVS or dot, dot, dot. I did all these carjackings or, you know, I, I murdered somebody or uh, I yelled and screamed at my mother and called her a hoe or, or, you know, I just, you know, have sex upon sex upon sex, uh, unprotected the majority of the times. I have multiple babies and I've aborted the majority of them because I didn't want them just like I didn't want their mother. And my heart's become calloused because all I know is oppression. And all I know is to give oppression. And I think that the idea of my oppression is my, my um, potential. All I have the potential to be in this world is oppressed. And it's a lie straight from the pit of hell. It's a nefarious or evil mentality. I don't have to tell you who or what side or where that idea comes from. You just look for yourself. You just stop and look. Where is it coming from? Who is espousing or who is saying these things? Right? Where does it come from? Listen. You just sit back and listen whether you like it or not. You really got to look at it. Is it? And I'm going to throw it out there. Just for this, in the context of this, for this reason alone. When it comes to political party, because just like we look only at black and white predominantly, and there's not just black and white, and there's not just Republican and Democrat, who's, who's espousing oppression? Who's talking about it the most? Who's pushing this ideology? Remember, we've got to stop saying, well, that Republican over there or that Democrat over there that person is a Democrat. That person is a Republican. If we stop personalizing these political views and start looking at them as ideologies that are carried out by a person but is not the personification of that person, we might start critically thinking about where is this coming from and is that an ideology 
that I want to follow? Whether it's a black person, a white person, a, a Hispanic person, an Asian person, um, a German person, uh, whoever. Whoever. Is it an ideology that I want to follow? Is this something that is going to build me up or tear me down? Is it something that's going to truly liberate my mindset or keep me oppressed in it? Coming back around. people and it's and it's more than just white people i know but it's predominantly white folks like it's white folks at a hip-hop concert right <laughs> i was used to wonder like if hip-hop is so like big which in a sense it still is i hardly you know pay attention to it anymore because most of it's just garbage um the ones that have the gift don't get recognized as they should the lyricists that should get recognized as they should really don't because we just settle for garbage. But at these concerts, the vast majority is white kids, right? White kids, Hispanic kids, not a lot of black kids. Why is that? I used to ask that a lot, but, but you really gotta ask. Where is this oppression rhetoric coming from? And when it comes to BLM, the organization, and Antifa, the organization, and whatever else ideology, ideology, ideology <laughs> any group that espouses this kind of ideology, you gotta ask, what is the demographic? Because it does matter to a degree. But then here's another part of it too. Why is it that this ideology comes across as we want to help you by telling you that you're oppressed and that everything is owed to you? You oppressed person. You, you're you black and you're oppressed. You're black. Most of these cats don't know what they're talking about. They're just vomiting and regurgitating these talking points that they've not really thought about. Just like I did when I was young, too. I get it. But we want to help you because you're oppressed. Colleges. Employers. It makes me sick that these schools will lower the standards. And these employers will lower their standards so that blacks can somehow become more successful? What a ridiculous idea in practice. We're going to lower our standards for you, but not everybody else, so you feel and you think erroneously that you are also successful. And when you leave this establishment, whether it's a school or an employer, you are subpar in your field and you're more dangerous because you really aren't as good still? That's, that's nefarious. That's sickening. Stop taking people's potential away by offering them a nefarious and false sense of success. Seeing this makes me, when I go back to start my master's up again, I want to ask the program director just to make sure. Because it's like, it, it makes me sick to think that this would happen. And say, hey, is there any part of this program that you decided because I'm black and you had to meet a quota or you're lowering the, lowering the standards for me because I'm black? Don't do that because I'm actually, this is my passion. Counseling and, and therapy is my passion. Mental health is my passion. I want to be an elite therapist. I want to be an elite counselor. I don't want to be subpar. Lastly, 
when I went to college. I went to college about four months, a little over four months after I had brain surgery. I think you may be able to see it. See this? There's this line right here, and it goes around. You might not be able to see it, but I had brain surgery. A little over four months later, I went to college. And I thought I was a good writer, just probably like a lot of kids think they're good writers or whatever. Most of them are good BSers. I had friends like that too. I was like, man, you guys are such good BSers. <laughs> and my English class, Professor Hawk, who has since passed away from, from uh, cancer. I went into class one day, had to write this two page paper and I thought two pages, oh my gosh, that's so much. It's nothing now. <laughs> but um, one of my classmates was sitting there and she was in tears. She was pretty sensitive anyway. And I can say that because she was. It's not just because, you know, Professor Howe. But he got to my paper. <laughs> and he had this, this interesting high-pitched voice, right? Yeah! <laughs> uh... And he looked at, he was looking at my paper and he threw it down. What is this garbage? Oh, I'm offended, right? I'm offended. How am I going to defend my offense? How I feel? Oh, I got it. I just had brain surgery. You don't know what I've been through. I just had brain surgery. And he stopped me. Dead. I don't care what you've been through. I know you can do it. And I'm going to help you. But you got to come with me. Don't you ever hand anything like this and again in my class. I see that you have potential. He saw it and he called it out. But don't you ever do that again. And I felt like, oh man, the Lord just got a hold of my heart. It's like, son, don't you ever lean on the crutch of your disability again. I didn't bring you through that just so you can lean on it and be subpar. No, 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 no. I went through that semester and I ended up getting a B in his class because he called me out in the beginning. Don't lean on your crutch or what you think is your crutch. You're more than that. And I'm going to show you. And he walked with me. Loved that man. He taught me, one of the things he taught me was about context. He said, if you can get the context of something you're reading, so oftentimes you have to finish what you're reading. You know all of it. And it's true. I could look at things and get the context, and I'm like, I know exactly what that is. He taught me that. But he challenged me to grow. He challenged me to reach my potential. If we continue, white people, if you continue to pity black people and, and, and just assume that all black people are oppressed somehow, well, you're just so oppressed. And lower the standard, you are robbing us of our potential. Don't do it. Stop robbing people of their potential and challenge them to come up. And if you really want to help somebody, walk with them and help them that way. But don't rob them of their potential. I was almost fully robbed of my potential. And I've had men and women in my life that would not let me get away with it. And I don't want to have anybody else to get away with it either. It's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. There was this kid in, uh, in junior high. I was his teacher's aide in the special education. Because I was in special education too. <laughs> and he had uh, Tourette's, right? That was his one, one of his disabilities challenges. But his biggest challenge was being a teenager. He tried to pull the same thing that I tried to pull on Professor Hawk one day. You don't know what I've been through. And I looked at him and said, I don't care. You tell me what you've been through. 
and I'll listen. But let me tell you where I've been and what I've been through. And I said, I'll walk with you. He became strong. He started to rise up. Proud of him. Because I wouldn't let him use his disability as an excuse either. But here's what the teachers would do. William, because it wasn't just him. William, why are you so hard on these kids? Don't you know they have a disability? Bro. I pull him aside. I said, let me tell you something. I have three quarters of my brain. <gasps> no, no, no. Don't feel bad for me. I'm a poet. I'm a published author. I've written one book, working on two, the second and third right now. I've gone to college, got my degree. I'm going to get my master's. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't pity me. I said, I don't, I'm not pushing them to break them. I'm pushing them to their greatness because I see it and I know it. Stop taking away and robbing people of their potential. Just stop. You're oppressed. No, you're not. Throw that ideology away. Come with me. I'm not oppressed. Things may not be fair. Things may be hard. You're not oppressed. I'm not oppressed. I reject that ideology. And I reject those who carry that ideology predominantly. But I welcome them to come to think on this side of the ideology. Nope. Not oppressed. Appreciate my history. Appreciate my ancestors, both those that are far gone and those who are still in my life that worked hard so that I could have a voice. I'm not oppressed. And history proves that too. So I won't live oppressed. Even when I feel like oh, this isn't fair. I can't afford to. I'm reaching my potential. Have a good day. Leave a like, comment, subscribe. Keep it respectful. Peace.